Hello everyone, welcome to commissioningandstartup.com. My name is Paul Turner and I help people and projects succeed at commissioning. So we've got an excellent webinar planned for you today. The topic for discussion today is operational readiness and we'll get right into the discussion. Uh, sorry about the mix up of emails this morning. We got that sorted out and uh, glad to have you here. So as mentioned, today's topic for discussion is operational readiness. First thing I'll go over is some of my commissioning experience for those that are new to this webinar series. We'll go through all of the operational readiness topics that I've got for you here today. I'll give you a brief heads up of the, my electrical commissioning course that's going to be released on Monday. And then we can have a bit of a live Q&A session. So as we're going through the discussion here, please submit any questions that you have in the chat box and we'll be sure to get them answered at the end of the, dis of the discussion. We're broadcasting on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Normally we're broadcasting on YouTube as well, but it doesn't look like that's currently working. Um, please enter all your questions in the chat box. We'll gather them up as we're going through the discussion here and answer them at the end of the discussion. <clears throat> we are listening to your feedback from the last survey, uh, last webinar. We did have a, a short survey and we heard that uh, everybody would like to know the duration of the discussion. So this discussion will be just slightly less than one hour. We'll uh, end at uh, half past, I guess it would be 7.30 in the morning Canada time. Another request for, was for a, a copy of the slide presentation and that will be available at the end of this discussion, I'll give you the link of where you can download the, the webinar certificate as well as a copy of the slides. One other comment that we heard quite frequently was to maybe shift this to more of a, a Zoom or one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many uh, type of discussion so that it can, can be a little bit more collaborative discussion. That's something that we definitely want to do at, at some point. Uh, for now, uh, I'd like to keep it, I guess, on, on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I guess the main reason is to allow more people to see the discussion. If we if we move to a, a Zoom or a Google Meet discussion, then it's maybe more of a closed discussion. So I want as many people to have access to this com commissioning information as possible. And maybe that, the best way to do that is on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So please stay to the end of the dis this discussion and we'll, we'll make sure you get the link so that you can access the webinar participation certificate as well as a copy of the slides. <clears throat> So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Paul Turner. I'm a professional electrical engineer and a registered project management professional. I have over 20 years of experience working on complex systems. I have a wonderful family. We live in Canada. Uh, the picture on the right there is actually my two children. We were in Nebraska a few years ago watching the full solar eclipse. It was 27 hours of driving for a three minute eclipse and it was absolutely worth it. It was a great experience. Some of the projects I've worked on in the aerospace industry, I've built satellites and rockets for the Canadian Space Agency. I've built payloads for the International Space Station. Uh, in power generation, I worked on a 200 megawatt hydro generating uh, station in Northern Canada. Power transmission, I was the commissioning manager for a 2300 megawatt HVDC link. Uh, that was a $5.2 billion project that we delivered on time and on budget. And currently, I am the commissioning manager for a wastewater treatment plant where we're upgrading the facilities uh, to accommodate a new biological process. So the topic for discussion today is operational readiness. This is an important topic for discussion since we want to have a, a smooth transition from the project to the operations and set the operating team up for the best chance of success and the commissioning team maybe isn't responsible entirely for operational readiness, but does play a large role in the operational readiness process, given that they're the last phase of the project and setting the operator up, uh, operations team up for success. So at in service date, the owner's operating team assumes care custody and control of the new facilities. They need to be prepared for continued operation and maintenance of the new assets and operational readiness is the process to ensure that the operations team is prepared for the new responsibility 
and is set up for the best chance of success for continued operation and maintenance of the new equipment. <clears throat> There's really two groups of operations that uh, need to be considered. There's the local on-site operators, as well as the central control operators in the uh, central control facility. Both of those groups need to be prepared and ready for handover of the new assets uh, and operating of the new assets. Unfortunately, I've worked on projects where <clears throat> the project team at the end of the project just drops their tools and runs from site, leaving the, the poor operators looking at each other wondering, okay, what do we do next with, these, with this new facility? And I don't think that's fair for anyone. It's certainly not the best value for the owner, and it's, it's not a, a great way to hand over a project at the end. There does need to be a soft handover, a transition from the project team to the operating team. And the commissioning team does play a large role in this in this handover. Commissioning team can participate in many of the tasks and provide information in order to help facilitate a lot of the operational readiness processes. So let's review what some of those operational readiness tasks are. Of course, on any project, there's mountains and mountains of documentation. It's not always everyone's most favorite aspect of the project, but it is definitely an important aspect of the project. And it's important to provide the operating team with the right documents, the ones that they're going to need on a daily basis to operate the new facilities and to hand them over in an organized manner so that they can understand what documents they are, where they are, what they need and how to find them when they are troubleshooting the system or operating the systems. So there's a few components of documentation. The facility documentation, this is the documentation that the operations team will need on a day-to-day -day basis. So this would include things like the, the station description document, the O&M manuals for uh, each of the pieces of equipment, probably most importantly, the red line or the as-built drawings, uh, defining the as-built configuration of the system. Uh, those are an important set of documents that the operating team will need. As well, they'll also need all the operating documentation. So this would be the SOPs or the standard operating procedures. And these can largely be based on a lot of the commissioning procedures. Some, uh, a lot of the switching procedures that the commissioning team would be doing are similar operations that the operating team will need to do during operation of the facilities, as well as SWPs or safe work procedures. So this would include all the lotto and PTW permit to work processes and procedures that operations is need to, going to need to operate within uh, to operate the equipment. <clears throat> so documentation would also include uh, a lot of the items that maybe aren't required on a day-to-day -day basis, but the operating team may need for reference. This would be the historical project information. They don't necessarily need to know about that RFI that was asking a question two years ago. Um, but they do want to have access to this information during troubleshooting. They might want to go back and look at some of that historical project information to get a bit more background on a particular failure or piece of equipment. So not necessarily organized in some sort of manner, but it does need to be archived somewhere so that operations can access this historical information if, if needed. All the construction turnover packages, so all the quality control processes, uh, construction quality documents uh, would be archived, all the commissioning turnover package information, so uh, test procedures, test results, uh, all the recording and data that was gathered, they may or may not need that information at some point in the future for troubleshooting, they may not, they wouldn't need it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but they would still need access to it just in case. And then all of this information, you need to establish where this documentation is archived, so with the magnitude of information that's produced on projects these days, uh, best is to do this in an electronic system. It used to be before where um, binders were printed out and then you'd deliver a room full of binders to the operating team and they, they seem to prefer that. But with even more and more information, it needs to be in an electronic system so then it's searchable and it can be organized in a logical manner so that people can find the information that they're looking for when they need it. One aspect to consider for operational readiness is uh, the site operating personnel and site support. So uh, 
Um, the commissioning team can support this in in some regards. Uh, a staffing plan may exist if uh, there's already an operating team that's assuming responsibility of the new facilities, but you may need to add additional staff within that operating structure and you need to prepare a staffing plan in advance. The reason I say that the commissioning team can can help with this is ideally the commissioning team and the operating team can c collaborate and it's worked very well on some projects I've worked in in the past where individuals that are on the commissioning team stay at the facility and become the operating team, the, the plant engineers and the operating technicians. All that information that's gathered or learned during commissioning is beneficial uh, if that group can can stay there and continue to be the operational group as well. Um, so that can uh, find some synergies between two staffing plans of the commissioning team and the operations team that works well. So if if you're working in a remote location other staffing plan considerations may be uh, a staff rotation cycle if individuals are going in for uh, say two weeks at a time and out or uh, say three weeks in and one week out, what is that rotation cycle? A common problem at the end of a project is as people start to see the end of the project coming, they're starting to look for their new role. They don't want to be left out and left at the end of the project without a, a role uh, coming forward. So you, you may find that some people are leaving the project before it's actually complete. And because of that, you may need to uh, implement some sort of staff retention strategy to predetermine where individuals will transition to. That way, if they know that in six months when the project's over, they're going to be uh, part of this organization, they're, they're less likely to leave the project at the end to try and find that, that next role. That's a consideration that might need to be put in place, uh, some sort of staffing retention strategy. Uh, an aspect to consider also is transportation and accommodation. If it's a, it's a remote location that the uh, facility is located, then uh, will where will operating staff live? Is accommodation required near site and how will they travel to and from site? Some of these things need to be thought about before in service date to prepare operations for uh, operation of the facilities. <clears throat> Maintenance contracts are another consideration. Um, if uh, some of that work will be done in-house or some of the maintenance work may be contracted out, you may need to have some maintenance contracts in place uh, at in-service date to continue on with uh, uh, maintenance tasks. That could be s simple things like lubricating equipment, replacing uh, filters and belts, those types of items. There might be also more specialized uh, site support required if you're, if you're managing uh, infrastructure maintenance or regulatory compliance, you may need some specialized skills like IT operational support or other types of specialized support on site for more specialized tasks. From an operating process and procedures, procedure standpoint, something to consider uh, during even during design is the alarm grouping. Uh, Often I see that the design engineers to categorize alarms as either priority one, priority two, priority three, not necessarily considering that at in-service date when the operations team there, a priority one alarm is going to generate a call out. And if the alarms aren't grouped correctly or are spuriously generating priority one alarms at two o'clock in the morning, operations team will get pretty frustrated pretty quickly if they're being called out uh, needlessly during the night for uh, unjustified priority one alarms. That definitely needs some collaboration between the operations team to make sure that the alarm grouping is correct and that the right uh, issues with the system are in fact generating a call out and waking up people in the middle of the night. You may have an instance where um, there's a performance guarantee period of the contract that runs in parallel with the warranty phase. And there may need to be uh, some established processes to gather information during that performance guarantee period for final contract closeout. So the engineering team and uh, the commercial team will need to work closely with the operating team to make sure that the right information is being gathered, the right data is available in order to make an assessment of how the system is performing to determine final contract closeout. 
And then of course, another important aspect is uh, the central control operators. The new facilities will need to be integrated into their new, uh, into their existing operator advisory tools. So if they, if there's an emergency management system or SCADA systems that the new system is incorporating with at the central control that needs to be built up in advance so that the central control group can monitor the new facilities. There may be several system operating studies that are required uh, in order to determine how to operate the new facility uh, with the existing facilities. So normal operating procedures would be developed out of those system operating studies. Communication procedures need to be established in regards to local operators versus central control operators and what is the decision making process uh, when there's issues that are encountered or when the system needs to be adjusted for operation, how do those protocols all work? And then with the immense amount of data that's generated from the systems these days, uh, there's a pile of information that's coming to the central control uh, station and data transfers and backup is a consideration as well as how is all this data received? How is it managed? How is it backed up? How is it controlled? <clears throat> so safety is of course, an important aspect of operational readiness. There would have been procedures as part of the project related to emergency response plans, spill response plans, environmental compliance permits, safety compliance. Um, these would have existed for the project, but they, they'll need to be modified slightly for in-service assets. And the project team, the commissioning team can help with some of that to transition those project specific plans and procedures to operational plans and procedures at in-service date. One item that will definitely change is the access management plan. If there's several people coming and going from the project, uh, could be hundreds of people coming and going from the project, that's definitely changes at in-service date where there's only a handful of people that are then coming and going from the project. So things like access management plans will change slightly at in-service date. A large component of operational readiness is also training. So there may be aspects of training that the contractor or vendor is provided. Contractor may provide a series of classroom and field training sessions to train the on-site operators. There may also be aspects of training that the owner provides. If there's new safety protocols that need to be implemented or things such as that, then the owner would uh, set up some of those training sessions as well. And then of course the central control operators will need training as well. The, the new systems will be integrated into existing systems. There will be different operating procedures and the control desk, desk operators will need to know how to manage and control the new facilities. In our last webinar, we spoke about cybersecurity compliance and the level of effort that is required in order to achieve NERC compliance, NERC SIP compliance. The ongoing cybersecurity clients compliance is also a concern as well, and the operating team needs to be set up for success to continue with ongoing cybersecurity compliance. The operating team will need to understand what is required to maintain compliance, or at least establish a dedicated cybersecurity team to maintain compliance. As we spoke about last time, the software management can be a huge task uh, for maintaining, for monitoring software patches assessing and implementing all those software patches to keep the system current. Data systems are a, are a consideration as well. So we talked about the performance guarantee monitoring period. If there's data that's gathered to confirm contract closeout, data systems may need to be put in place to record this information. Another example might be a, a TFR, a transient fault recorder on the last project I worked on. There was a project, a system-wide transient fault recorder that was monitoring and uh, controlling uh, all the different data points of the system. So the new system we were working on had to be integrated into the existing TFR in order to monitor the new system and look at all the changing parameters within the system. Now this is always a big consideration and a, a large amount of work is to set up an EAM system. So that's the Equipment Asset Management System. The operations team will require an electronic system to store operating data and manage maintenance of the new facilities. So there's a few aspects of this. The, the asset management system itself contains all the operational information, 
on the system. This would be things such as the nameplate data, system hierarchy, basically anything that requires maintenance within the system. So that could be any anything even down to a fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher, for example, needs routine inspections to make sure that it hasn't expired or rotating the item so uh, uh, chemical inside isn't settling at the bottom of the tank. Anything and everything that requires maintenance or activities to be done on them is loaded into the asset management system. What that then does is it's used for the work management system. So as work is required or uh, warranty items or maintenance items are required on any of the equipment, the work management system will generate a work order for maintenance tasks or for warranty requirements. So any routine inspections that are required for preventative maintenance, if there's a a six month overhaul or an, an annual overhaul where a machine is completely disassembled and there's a visual inspection that needs to take place. All of those things are loaded into the work management system so that the work orders are generated at the proper frequency in order to ensure that work is conducted when it needs to be conducted. The work management system will also generate all the work orders for uh, maintaining regulatory compliance. So if there's software patches that need to be updated or hardware that needs to be replaced because it's obsolete, work management system will generate work orders for that. So really the, the EAM, the Equipment Asset Management System is controlling and managing all the data of the new assets and helping the operations team uh, ensure that the right tasks are being conducted on the equipment at the right time. That will ensure that warranty requirements are being met and that will ensure that operations and the owner receives the best value out of the assets to uh, uh, receive the full length of lifetime of the assets because the correct preventative maintenance activities are being conducted. So anything like all the warranty information, all this is loaded into the, the EAM system. One thing that's conducted is a critical spares assessment. So any of the spares that are determined uh, to be needed uh, on site, those are also lo loaded into the EAM system. And even something like a spare sitting on a shelf requires periodic maintenance if it needs to be rotated or lubricated or something, then uh, the work management system will generate the task orders, the work orders in order to maintain the spares. The EAM system will have a pile of data, so data backup is an important aspect to consider for EAM. As well, you'll also need to determine an obsolescent strategy. A lot of these, most of the systems that are being inst installed these days are computer-based systems and eventually everything becomes obsolete. You can build a brand new system, all computer-based system, and within five years it's, it's obsolete. So something to think about is an obsolescent strategy is how is that going to be maintained? If you can no longer get replacement parts, if you can no longer get software patches, then you you therefore aren't NERC compliant, cyber compliant, or something like that. As equipment becomes obsolete, how is that going to be dealt with? Equipment and materials are an important consideration for operational readiness. There's a certain level of consumables that operations team will need such as lubricants or filters or belts. You need to determine what consumables are required. The rate of consumption and where consumables will be stored is a external supply contract required in order to have these consumables on site. Are they stored on site or is it just in time delivery? Some of the maintenance tasks will also require special tools or special equipment. If there are certain handling fixtures that are required for an annual maintenance, then those will need to be planned for and purchased and available at in-service date. Lots of tools uh, such as a crane or a boom lift may be required for certain maintenance activities. And operations team will essentially need to review the required tasks uh, and list the special, special tooling that is required. Some of these items can have a long procurement timeline and they need to be planned for in advance during the project so that they're available at in service. And of course, all safety PPE must be available. Even things such simple things such as the plant furniture and appliances, the uh, fridges, lunch rooms, basic equipment needs to be purchased. Um, the operating desks, the operating chairs, office desks, chairs, lunchroom equipment, all those items need to be planned for. And so operations is 
happy and comfortable in the new facilities. And from a commissioning aspect, um, there's a few things to consider for operational readiness. So the, the formal transfer of care, custody, and control documentation needs to be established. It's not as simple as just completing commissioning and uh, handing the owner the keys. There is a process to be able to uh, assume responsibility and continued operation of it. It should be a, a formal process, and this should be uh, defined in advance so that when it comes to that time, it's simply execution of uh, the formal handover from one group to the other. There may need to be uh, some service level operating agreements established between local operators and central control operators. There does need to be some thought put into that as part of the, the formal transfer of care, custody and control. The commissioning team can help with definition of type A and type B deficiency process. Um, that'll take place during the project, but where it becomes critical is a type C deficiency because a type C deficiency is something as, that's defined as an item that can be fixed after handover to the owner. So you definitely want agreement with the owner and the operating team on what is a type C deficiency and having them agree on what is actually on that list. You don't want to get to the end of the project and have a, a big long list of type C deficiencies that the owner feels aren't type C deficiencies and should in fact be type B deficiencies. That's definitely going to delay your handover. So you want to have a close collaboration there at the end of the project to establish, okay, here's the few items that are going to be fixed during the warranty phase after handover to the owner. A lot of these items, the type A, B, and C deficiencies, may be items that are lingering from construction. They could be minor um, dents on the wall or, or paint damage, whatever that could be. Uh, the construction group will manage a lot of those. Some of them may be commissioning related, um, but the groups need to work together to establish that type C deficiency process. And the commissioning team uh, plays a large role in the trial period. So at the end of the project, once everything is fully commissioned, there may be a period of say a day, a week, or a month where the system needs to operate uninterrupted for a period of time. And you need to have agreement with the owner and the contractor on one, what constitutes a restart of the trial period. This will be a point that has lots of discussion because everybody will, <clears throat> will wanna know upfront exactly what's going to happen if there is a restart required. The contractor will of course say, well, no, that wasn't a restart. Restart, And the owner will of course say, yes, that does constitute a restart. And you can't be having that debate during the actual trial period. Those discussions need to happen in advance so that everybody's on the same page going into trial operation. So those are some of the operational readiness items <clears throat> from my experience on past projects that need to be looked at. Um, there's probably a few others and I'd be interested in hearing others experience in the, the chat box there. We can move into our live Q&A shortly. Just before we do that, I want to give everybody a heads up that my new electrical commissioning course is going to be available on October 5th. That's Monday. Coming up very soon, I'm just putting the final touches on it right now. It looks pretty good. We have 18 videos on the commissioning process. Each of them looks fantastic. There's six lessons on electrical systems and more to come even after Monday. And next week, starting on Monday, I'll be offering a 50% discount only for next week. So be sure to check your email, watch for access to this course, and I hope you can take advantage of it. So let's move into the live Q&A period here. I see there's a few questions that have come in and I'll see how many we can answer. I've got about 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, we can go through some of the live Q&A and we'll see how far we get. So the first question I've got from Med is, how does the project manager control quality? So there's two aspects of quality to consider is quality control and quality assurance. Quality control is the contractor's responsibility. So the contractor would be required to have some sort of quality management system implemented internally that anything that's being built uh, is going through their QC process to ensure that it meets contract requirements. 
They should be doing all the checks, point to point checks, anything to confirm that what they've installed meets contract requirements, meets the drawing requirements, meets all the technical requirements and is going to function as intended in the contract. Then the second aspect of that is quality assurance. So that would be uh, a group on the owner's side, either a, a consultant or uh, uh, maybe the owner themselves, some sort of specialized group that then goes in and verifies uh, that the contractor is doing their quality control response uh, responsibilities. So it's not necessarily that the QA is going doing 100% inspections to confirm uh, or redo a point to point checks, but they're confirming maybe by witness in the field or by paperwork or some sort of aspect to confirm that yes, the contractor has in fact done their quality control processes. So from a project manager's perspective, the project manager really needs to ensure that those two groups are properly implementing their uh, quality control and quality assurance functions. There's a few ways to do that. The project manager can periodically, say every six months or annually or depending on how things are going more frequently, can institute a, a quality audit where they can go in and, and uh, verify the contractor's internal quality control programs, look through their processes, understand their QMS, audit uh, some of their documents, and confirm that their, pro their plan that they're implementing actually makes sense, and to confirm that the contractor is actually following their plan. Then the project manager can also do the same on the, the QA. They can audit the QA processes and make sure that the QA plan makes sense and that it is in fact being implemented as defined in the QA plan. Out of this audit, there can be recommendations or things that need to change or be updated. The project manager can ensure that those are issued to all the groups and make sure that they're followed through on to correct any gaps or deficiencies that are identified in the quality management process. But from a commissioning perspective, I can say that this is critically important if if the quality processes prior to commissioning during the construction phase aren't being implemented or don't exist whatsoever, then commissioning team is not being set up for success. We're going to receive a, a pile of junk that isn't going to work or isn't going to be installed correctly, and it can lead to nothing but nightmares. And then the poor commissioning team is being looked at saying, you got to finish this, the project's over, why isn't this stuff working? Well, a couple of years of inadequate quality control processes and quality assurance processes before Commissioning certainly hasn't helped. At that point in time, nobody's too concerned. They're just putting pressure on commissioning and saying, get this done. So a very good question, Med. <clears throat> so next question I've got is, how can I get access to commissioning procedures and commissioning checklist templates? <clears throat> so this is something we've actually put together in in our mechanical commissioning course and in our electrical commissioning course that is being uh, issued on Monday, there's uh, several suites of commissioning procedures and commissioning checklists. In the mechanical commissioning course, there's over 80 uh, checklists and procedures that you can get access to in there. The electrical course, similar. Uh, it'll be 80 or more. I haven't got the full total quite yet, but uh, there's a a pile of documents in there that are great templates to use on your projects if you want access to uh, commissioning procedures or checklists that you can use as, as templates. When I've looked online for a lot of the uh, examples, I haven't found anything that's really good, which is one of the reasons I wanted to put together this resource so that people can draw on these examples and hopefully apply them to their projects. So definitely please check those out. <clears throat> From Richard, the question is, what types of documents need to be checked to make sure everything is complete prior to commissioning and startup, and who exactly approved those documents to start the operation rolling? <clears throat> so a critical document to consider is the handover from the construction team to the commissioning team, which is defined as a mechanical completion. Prior to the mechanical completion, the construction group, as part of their quality control processes, would hopefully be implementing and following inspection test plans. So the ITPs would define the various checks that the construction team needs to perform leading up to mechanical completion. So it could be things of checking torques on bolts or witness striping bolts, um, some simple uh, vibration tests, or maybe uh, flushing or leak testing 
pressure testing of piping. The ITPs would define all of those tasks that the construction team needs to complete to confirm that uh, quality is correct. Uh, so then the next set of documents would be uh, the mechanical completion checklists themselves. So this would be um, a joint walkthrough between the construction team and the commissioning team to witness the equipment in the field. It's typically called a P&ID walkthrough. Uh, you take the P&ID drawing out in the field, or if it's an electrical system you're reviewing, you take the cable lists and uh, wiring diagrams out in the field with a highlighter and confirm that everything is installed per contract. Assuming everything is correct in the mechanical completion, then that document is signed off. Then following that is when you get into pre-commissioning and commissioning, and that's when your commissioning checklists and your commissioning procedures are executed that would have been pre prepared uh, many months in advance leading up to uh, commissioning. So those are those are some of the documents that are required. Um, there's certainly a little bit more detail there to, to each of those. Um, okay, I can see your second part of your question is who exactly approves those documents? So if the construction group has a proper quality management system implemented, then the quality manager uh, overseeing that process would be reviewing and approving the ITP documents for uh, the construction group. Then it's really, uh, once we get into commissioning checklists and commissioning procedures, um, not everybody can be an equipment expert on every piece of equipment. So there's a few people that are involved in reviewing those documents. If you have a consultant involved and uh, they're the subject matter expert on that particular piece of equipment, it's very likely that someone on the consulting group is preparing that document and then it's being reviewed by the individual with many years of experience to approve that the right things are being verified in that document. Ultimately, it would be the commissioning manager that would be responsible to approve uh, those documents. But since the commissioning manager isn't necessarily an equipment expert in every aspect of the project, they may rely on those subject matter experts that exist in other groups of the project to review and approve those documents. So I hope that answers your question, Richard. <coughs> Question from Awaludin. When we need to start implementing EAM, is it when commissioning starts or after commissioning is completed? EAM can be a large task to implement. I've seen it rushed at the end of the project and uh, to, to set it up properly, it re really needs to be set up uh, during the commissioning phase. So um, not necessarily implemented. It would need to be implemented at in service date because the, the project processes would be slightly different than the operating processes. If there's maintenance that's required on a piece of equipment that's still under the contractor's care, custody and control, the contractor is responsible to perform that maintenance. Only at in service date when the contractor steps away and says, now this is the owner's equipment, does the owner have to actually perform that maintenance? And at that point is when the EAM system would be generating the work orders required for operations to do that maintenance. Um, certainly it's it's best to start building the system and populating with all the data, uh, gathering all the nameplate information and loading in uh, particularly the, the operating procedures and maintenance tasks in there so that at in service date, it's ready to start uh, being used by the operating team and uh, generating the proper work orders. If it's not, then there could be a period of time where operations are scrambling a little bit and they don't necessarily have the direction on what to do and, and when to do it. That maintenance tasks can get missed, that can void warranty of your system. So you, you want to have your EAM system up and running just prior to in-service date so that you can fully implement it and start using it at in-service date. So I hope that answers your question, Awaludin. Question from Fami. In your experience during startup, Actually, many noises need more time to get a plant on spec. How to reduce noise to speed up your stable system? So oh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, it's tough to say that you want to speed up your your system for stable operation without a a plan in advance. It's it's pretty tough to do right on the spot. Is try and figure out a way to to speed it up. Really, you need to think about that a few months in advance and determine what is the the proper methodology and what is the proper timeline required to obtain stable operation of your system. If it's going to take if it's going to take a month, it's it's going to take a month. If uh, 
if the owner wants that to take two weeks, then you'll have to plan for that in advance and either have double the amount of resources or double the amount of test equipment or something. It would be very hard to to show up on site and determine, okay, we want this to take half the time without having that planned in advance, know that you have the test, test equipment or resources available uh, to speed that up. Um, it all comes down to your, your project commissioning plan and, and how well you've planned in advance to, to execute. But it's, it's pretty tough to make it uh, happen quicker right on the spot without having a good plan in place in advance. So I hope that qu answers your question, Fami. Question from Alvarezi. For IO checking, sequence checking, and loop checking, do you think there is a more efficient way to conduct these tests and diagnose problems quickly? It's maybe going to depend on the system. A lot of it is uh, uh, custom wired cables between communication cubicles that uh, it's brute force. You got to get out there and, and do all the point to point checks and, and check the cables of the system. There may be systems that exist where they're more uh, standard off the shelf and wired the same every time. And maybe you can generate some sort of uh, electronic automatic process to, to test those systems where you can plug in your test equipment and it just flicks through each of the point to points there and verifies everything. But if everything's custom made and uh, custom designed for the project, it may be tough to come up with some sort of generic test equipment or test sequence to, to test those items. Um, if uh, if you're doing loop checking and every loop is, is different with different end devices, then it's kind of a, a custom test for each loop. Now, that's, that's not to say you could find a, a better way if you, if it's a process where you're installing the same five loops on every project, then you certainly could uh, have a device that plugs in at the end there and automatically checks through all devices. I can think of an example that might be related on, on one of my aerospace projects when we were testing uh, satellite hardware to go into space. There was uh, the test suite had to be repeated multiple times on low voltage, high voltage, high temperature, low temperature, uh, nominal temperature, and the same set of tests. The, the, the suite of tests would take about three days to complete, and we had to do that about a dozen times. So in that case, we did develop an automatic test set to go through and verify that three days of test at each uh, minimum voltage or maximum voltage or whatever. So if you got in that scenario where things were getting repetitive there, you certainly could have your test set going through that automatic suite of tests to speed things up. If we hadn't done that for uh, the satellite hardware that we were testing, I'm sure that I would still be testing that system, but we knew that it was going to be repeated uh, a dozen times. So we did build a, a custom test set to go through that a lot more rapidly. Next question is from Dylan. What are the standards you usually use or base from when doing commissioning? Do you get something from, let us say, ASHRAE guideline zero? Um, yes, there are some typical standards that, that come up during commissioning. ASHRAE is one of them, uh, ANSI is another, IEEE, NFPA are, are typical standards that we see come along um, during commissioning. Those ones are often referred to in the technical specification and then the technical spec of your contract would provide additional details, maybe more specific to the project. So if it's, if it's something generic that's covered in ASHRAE, then it'll be definitely referred to in your technical specification, then the tech spec will provide the more specific requirements that the project needs to meet to, to meet the owner's requirements. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that answers your question, Dylan. So a question from Richard, as a commissioning engineer at site, what needs to be done or checks before commencing the job at site? So that's a good point to cover, Richard. That would essentially be, uh, what you're asking is what needs to be completed at mechanical completion to confirm that the systems are ready to be commissioned. So as part of uh, the commissioning team mobilizing to site, they'd probably be mobilizing uh, a bit of time in advance of uh, when mechanical completions are going to be uh, signed off. 
So the, the checks that need to be done would be defined in the contractor's quality control plan. Something like uh, the ITPs need to be completed. So uh, it's, it's very valuable for the commissioning team to review those ITPs and confirm that the right things are being checked in there before mechanical completion. If checks aren't being done or even worse, there's no quality management system whatsoever, that's going to be a problem for commissioning. Um, so let's maybe go through some examples of what needs to be checked in, in an ITP. Um, let's think about uh, how about a large oil filled transformer. Uh, the ITP would in installation of the transformer would include placing the large item on the concrete pad, bolting it down, uh, connecting all the peripheral equipment and filling it with oil and getting it uh, prepared for commissioning. So some of the items identified in the ITP, I can think of one would be performing an oil sample before and after energization. Um, the ITP is going to define what needs to be checked and verified between those two oil samples. Um, another example I could think of would be uh, testing of uh, the dielectrics. Um, what needs to uh, be tested even say before it arrives at site during factory acceptance testing or in a third party facility. Um, high voltage or high pot testing um, to confirm that the dielectrics are correct even before they arrive at site of the large transformer. Any of the uh, high pot testing that's confirmed um, on site. Um, any of the, I can think of some of the, the bushings or maybe a uh, arresters that need to be tested in an ITP. Um, those are some specific examples, but really you want to make sure that the construction quality program is capturing all items that you would expect to see in an ITP and feedback from the commissioning team into that ITP process uh, is definitely valuable so that the right things are being checked and that the commissioning team knows what's being received uh, at uh, mechanical completion. Okay, so let's see what else we've got here. Question from Mel. What is the best way of handling defects and concerns that will occur after turnover to operations team within the warranty period? This is a, an important aspect of operational readiness to make sure that the, the warranty processes are in place with the contractor. So typically um, operations would be operating the facility and if they see something that's not correct, the commissioning team may in fact uh, be available after the project. It may be that one of the commissioning team members is assigned to the operating team for a period of time just to help with any issues like this. Anything that's noti noticed is then uh, flagged from the operations team to the, the commissioning engineer to troubleshoot and determine what's wrong with that particular item and maybe suggest a solution. Based on that investigation, then it may go back to the contractor as a, a warranty item where a piece of equipment's failed or it no longer meets the technical requirements. Contractor is then required to come in and remedy that item. For large systems, it may be that the contractor has an individual or a few individuals that remain on site to monitor the warranty period and address any of these issues that come up. Now, that's not always the case. The contractor may fully demob from site and then they're brought back into site for any issues that need to be addressed. If there's critical issues that are time sensitive, the contractor may have to mobilize very quickly. Maybe a lot of the items are minor in nature and they're gathered up and the contractor would come back to site and address those, say in a, a single trip to rectify any of the issues that are encountered. So I hope that answers your question, Mel. All right, I'm not seeing uh, any more questions that are coming in. Those were some great questions. I appreciate everyone's input into the discussion here. So one more heads up on uh, our electrical commissioning course. Watch your email for next Monday on how you can receive exclusive access to this course at the, a discount that we'll be offering 
be sure to mark your calendar, check your email, and we'll send you that information on Monday. So in order to receive the participation certificate for this webinar, this is a sample of the certificate. Uh, there's a short survey to complete, and we appreciate your input. Uh, so please complete the short survey and you'll be able to access the certificate. And then, like I spoke about earlier, um, a copy of the slides will be available in that email as well to receive your certificate, as well as a link to sign up for our next webinar. Our next webinar is scheduled for October 22nd, and the topic will be commissioning safety. So please sign up for that discussion as we discuss that very important topic. You can access the uh, certificate, the slides, and the sign-up link at commissioningandstartup.com slash webinar dash cert. So please check out that link and access those documents. Thank you everyone for joining today's discussion and I hope to see you at the next one.